What's up guys, Joe Munoz, OneStepPrep.com. Happy holiday season to you and yours first and foremost. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, wishing you and yours nothing but health and wealth, many blessings and much abundance in not only 2025, but in all the years to come. I'm gonna talk in this video about Airspeed Unreliable. I have another video where I talk about it, mainly in the 320, uh, and I talk about the memory item of Airspeed Unreliable, but here I'm gonna talk more generic uh, to really all jets and mostly in the phase of flight that has to do with cruise. I received a voice chat, voice memo from a pilot buddy of mine that he was talking amongst another pilot group of his and they were looking for some clarification tips and what have you that I could provide and I thought this was a really a, uh, a, a good enough and meaningful enough discussion to put it on a YouTube video. So let's talk about airspeed unreliable. Um, the first thing I want to share with you is that it's somewhat challenging to truly accept that you have an erroneous indication because let's face it, the vast majority of the time, fortunately, our indications are accurate. And so when you're looking at an indication, could be anything, and today's video happens to be airspeed, uh, is it truly, is what you're looking at true? In other words, do you really have an erroneous airspeed or not? And let's say that you do, okay? You, you, you figure out, you've done your cross comparison, you've looked at the captains versus the first officers, indicated airspeed, you've looked at the standby indicated airspeed, you cross-reference it maybe with the GPS speed and the ground speed and against the three indicators and you realize, yeah, we have, we actually do indeed have an unreliable speed. Okay, so once you've identified that, the first thing, if you're not already doing so, I would advise is level off. Um, leveling off is a great thing to do because as you're climbing or descending, that could have an effect on the airspeed indications that you're seeing that are ultimately not reliable, but because you're so used to them being reliable, you may pitch erroneously and apply the wrong input as you're having a difficult time accepting the fact that you're looking at an indication that's not true. The next thing I would share with you is once you level off, and by the way, leveling off uh, is easier to do if you have a flight path vector. And this was a discussion I was going to have a little bit later in the video, but it's a great time to bring it up now. Your flight path vector or flight path angle, tomato, tomato, is really going to aid and help you in establishing where level flight is. Now, the flight path vector is available in the 737NG. It's available in a 320, and it is entirely fed from the IRS, the inertial reference system, which is great. It's isolated from the pedostatic system, so regardless of what you're erroneous airspeed indication is, you know that at the very least your flight path vector or flight path angle is accurate. And simply placing it on the horizon right here is gonna give you level flight. Now even if you don't have that, putting the aircraft at an approximate positive four degrees nose up is gonna be the trick in most swept wing transport jets. I'm gonna give you a lot of um, generic and generalities in terms of numbers and power settings and pitch settings and things like that. So, you know, before I give you anything, I'm gonna preface it and say ultimately consult your aircraft's flight crew training manual or performance section to have a better understanding of pitch and power settings. But in general, some usual safe numbers in most transport jets, I break it down into three sections. Basically, uh, anything uh, be in the below, t we're going to say low altitude, which I consider to be below 20,000 feet, right? So anything down here in the teens and less than 20s, my power setting is approximately 60% and 1. And this is below 20s. Okay, so we're down in the teens, maybe even 10,000, 5,000. From 20 to 30 in the 20s, all right? So in the 20s over here, I guess I'll put it up top. In the 20s, up to 30, okay, we're looking at a power setting of about 70% and one. And in the 30s up here, we're looking at a power setting of about 80% and one. So, 30s, 20s, and anything below 20, which would be considered in my definition low altitude, is about 60%. So, let's go back to the tip I sent back to my friend. I said, hey, you know what? Consult your performance section is the, the, the answer, but to give you some tips since you asked for it, the flight path vector is IRS fed, so it's accurate, put it on the horizon, remain in level flight, assess your altitude, and then go 60, 70, 80. 60 below 20, 70 in the 20s, and 80 in the 30s. Now here's a great picture just to validate this. Uh, cruising on around mid 30s, I think around 38,000 feet. You can see the thrust setting here. Again, somewhere in the neighborhood of 
are these numbers going to be 100% accurate? These are ballpark figures. And it very much, as I said, depends on various factors, not only the jet you're flying, but the weight, right? Density, altitude, there's a few variables here to consider. But in general, it's fairly safe to say the best thing you could do is level off, assuming you're at a safe altitude, get that flight path vector or flight path angle on and get ready to set up a pitch and power setting that you know is going to be safe. Positive four degrees with 60, 70, or 80 as applicable or as appropriate is going to be a, a good go-to starting point before you actually fine-tune everything. Now remember, this is trivial knowledge. This is something to kind of help you out as a tip. Ultimately, we have to apply the memory item. We have to apply the ECAM action. We have to apply the QRH, right? There's a pro pro protocol and procedure that has to be applied. But in general, I do like to provide what insights I can and things that I know will kind of help you in a moment of uh, trying to come to terms and acceptance that you actually have indications that are not accurate. Now, interestingly enough, I'll share with you, this is a true story. I took off from Myrtle Beach uh, maybe three, four months ago. Uh, on the rotation, we had a bird strike. My pitot tube was blocked. Um, and we ultimately ended up with uh, an air, not just an airspeed unreliable, it was a, a lack of airspeed entirely. We did have one indication still with airspeed. Now, uh, interestingly enough, there was no ECAM that popped up, um, and at least not immediately. Later on, we got an ECAM that popped up, but I knew right away what happened. I mean, just based on the fact that when we rotated and in the, in the landing lights, I could kind of see what appeared to be a bird and then uh, you know, the impact of it, I pretty much knew that it was a bird strike that clogged the pitot tube. And so ultimately, as we were climbing out, uh, I started thinking to myself, you know, are we gonna, is an ECAM gonna pop up at any moment? Nothing's popping up. Uh, I'm comparing the uh, captain's airspeed indication with the uh, standby indication. I was not flying at this time, by the way. Uh, it was a, I was a pilot monitoring. And so ultimately, as I'm doing this cross comparison, I can see, okay, we have, it's not that we have an unreliable speed, we have just a lack of airspeed, and we have two gauges that are indicating correctly. Um, and so trivial uh, knowledge and system knowledge tells me that I know we have an uh, air data, uh, ADARU, that I can switch and put it on the number three because we ultimately have three ADARUs, and in doing so, I will regain airspeed on the side that has failed. Um, and so this is one of these things where I knew system-wise that that would happen, uh, system knowledge-wise, and later on, uh, what ended up happening was we did get the ECAM, which really just said ADARU fault. Uh, it directed us to turn off the inoperative one and then place the switching panel on number three for the failed side. Uh, the FCOM later on directed to do that as well, but it's one of these things where having the system knowledge and trivial knowledge, you can kind of know what's coming and already uh, take steps that are going to help you in restoring and regaining um, some good situational awareness and instruments that are ultimately uh, not working for you. So having a foundation of knowledge is really what breeds not competence alone, but confidence. And that's what we strive for here at One Step Prep. So I very much hope to see you here in Miami in the coming new year of 2025 doing a type rating with us or preparing with us or doing something with us, all right? So look forward to it. You guys know the site, onestepprep.com. Want to enjoy your friends and training program success. Hope you found value in the video. All the best to you and your family. We'll see you here next year in 25.